You know, I, I appreciate being called a great man. That makes me feel good. So is, is this actually recording me or is it uh, helping with... Okay, well good. And I, I, see, I, see the, I see the cameras on. Okay. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for, being, for waiting on me. I, I, I drove down here about 6.15 today and I said, no, this can't be right. This can't be right. So I drove all the way back into Tyler and now back, uh, I made it here. And so uh, my name is Father Nolan Lowry. I actually, I am from Gilmer, but I grew up uh, partly in, here in South Tyler. And so around the Sunnybrook area, kind of not too far off where the Todds live. And uh, then we moved to Gilmer when I was in seventh grade. But I'm a convert to the Catholic faith. I come from, um, I was going to Green Acres Baptist Church when I was growing up here. Also to First Presbyterian, not too far off from the cathedral. Are you all parishioners of the cathedral? Anybody not? Okay, okay, good. So y'all meet in the middle. Yeah. Wow, how, how ecumenical. Yeah. <laughs> so y'all are here, all right, good deal. Well, uh, I, I thought it would be good just to kind of give you this background because my very first experience in a Catholic church was at the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception. Probably was about 1992 or 93. I was about 12 back then. No, sorry, not that old. I was, uh, I was about eight, uh, seven or eight. So just to put it in, uh, in 1992, I was about eight years old. And my experience of, of Christianity up to that point had been Green Acres. This was before the big one got built. And so to go into the cathedral, of course at that time, I don't know if you remember, there was orange carpet. <laughs> but everything else was beautiful. <laughs> but it, uh, I was fascinated. All the images, the stained glass, uh, you had the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And I'd gone there because my dad's sister uh, is a Catholic. She had married a Catholic and had become Catholic. And so I remember asking my cousins, I said, who is that? And they said, oh, that's, that's Jesus' mother. I said, oh, well, who's that? That's St. Joseph. And so I don't remember much about the Mass, but I will tell you this, that when I, when I was looking at the priest, I can't remember if it was Monsignor Milam Joseph at that point or, or Monsignor Strickland. Uh, all I remember is that I thought that the altar servers were the priest's children. <laughs> It made sense, right? You know, the, pre the preacher's got all his kids up, in the, uh, up, in up on the altar and everything. Uh, and uh, it's interesting that that's, uh, they're, they're, there's true spiritual children uh, up in the sanctuary. But my, uh, my parents ended up becoming Catholic, and I, I got a, that's a whole great story, and Father Hank certainly knows a little bit about it, but I kind of resisted. I wasn't ready yet. I, I, I was intrigued by Catholicism, but I didn't quite understand the Mass. I wasn't against the ritual. I wasn't against, um, you know, the traditions of those Catholics. It just wasn't something I was ready to enter into yet. Uh, but I ended up becoming Catholic through St. Mary's in Longview. My family, we moved to Gilmer. There wasn't a whole lot in Gilmer at that time. They opened up St. Francis Church at some point. But I actually went through RCIA in Gilmer. And I lived a pretty normal high school kid life until entering seminary right after high school in 2002. But you're here tonight because um, there's alcohol. No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, you, you're, you're here because uh, you want to get theology uncapped. And I, I wanted to talk a little bit about my, my specialty is actually not liturgy. My specialty in theology is moral theology. But I have a great zeal to want to help Catholics, but especially Catholic men, uh, fall in love with the Mass. Because if you go to Mass on Sundays, you look around, there are a few really holy women praying the rosary. A lot of them are in their 60s. Um, but you look at most men and they look bored. And oftentimes, um, even if the women and even sometimes if the kids are into Mass, the man's oftentimes reading the bulletin, you know, like really high towards visible to the priest. <laughs> and uh, it just seems like a lot of men are uninterested in what is happening. And the reality is that at the Mass, we don't even realize this, but there's, a, but, the great, but there's a plotting of spies against the Prince of Darkness going on. That the line of the tribe of Judah sneaks into our midst. We don't even realize it's the great King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
because we've been so numb through the years. And you know, it's not a matter, it's, I'm not here to necessarily talk about you know, why we've gotten numbed. The reality is that we need a little bit of a, what, what, what Peter Kraft calls a Jesus shock. That if we really understood who it is that we encounter at every Mass, it would turn our lives upside down. It would make us be the men that we're called to be. It would make all of Christ's people be the people of God that they're called to be. But particularly as, 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 as men, as men of God, as husbands, as fathers, if we're really focused on what the Mass is all about and really doing everything we need to do from our end and, and understanding and putting our whole heart into it, it's going to be a very, very deep experience. Uh, it's going to transform our, our lives in terms of uh, what we, uh, our jobs, in terms of uh, what we do for uh, a living, what we do, how we, how we deal with our family, with our kids. And so that's what I wanted to speak a little bit about, mainly before I get into really just the theology of the Mass itself. I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about just preparing yourself. Um, because if, if we come prepared, we're a little bit more able to, to really kind of get the theology. And so, before I open that, I just want to ask a few of your suggestions. Um, through the years, what have you found that helps you prepare for Mass? Anyone can answer? Uh... Read the readings beforehand. Okay, and how do you, where do you find those readings? Uh, app on the smartphone on the way to the Mass. That's right. Okay. So we all, we all are, um, we're all addicted to the little, um, the, the symbol of our fall, the apple with a bite out of it. <laughs> so you can get really good apps for, uh, for your iPhone or other um, inferior device um, to, the, to the iPhone. But, okay, there's also... Uh, have any of you heard of Magnificat before? Magnificat is a publication that's called, it's, it's called Magnificat, which is the Latin uh, for My Soul Glorifies the Lord. It's a really good publication that you, you can subscribe to, either a paper version or uh, an app version. Then there's Word Among Us. Uh, and then, of course, you, if you want to look at it free, um, is your app free uh, to Adam? Or Okay, so Ladate is a good one, yeah. And then if you go to usccb.org, which is U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, you can always pull up the readings for the day. And I find that even as a priest, if I read the readings the night before, it's on your mind. There's a, Deacon. There's a book out that's called Abide My Word that has the year's readings. USCCB will actually email it to you every month. That's right, if you sign up to it. That's, that's how you get, that's right, if you get on their list, you'll get other stuff too in the email too. Any other suggestions for how to get ready for Mass? How to get yourself in, in the uh, prepared, how to get your heart ready to receive what God wants to give you? Other than readings. Well, one of the things that my wife and I try to do, we're not always good, is to get to Mass early enough to take time to Okay. Do you have any small children at home anymore, sir? Uh, <laughs> I do my very best not to scream at mine. That's all. Yeah. Yes. When you're not screaming at your children, um, so certainly I think, because here's the thing, is I find that, that those who don't have young children at home anymore find it easier to get to Mass yeah. early, and then those with little children find it easy to get to Mass um, not at all. <laughs> you have a time limit. You only got like... 35 minutes with your kids in the church. So at the end of that 35 minutes, it's it's done. So if you're a little bit late, then you might make it to the end of Mass. <laughs> right. Well, but thank you for that. Um, our Director of Youth Evangelization, thank you. It's the kids who come with the time. <laughs> Gentlemen. Oh, y'all ready to, pr um, would y'all like to eat? Right, guys come out. Okay, let's do that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, thank you so much this evening for opportunity to really grow in our love for Christ and the Holy Mass. Help us to enjoy this time of fellowship and of theology and of uh, drink that gives warmth to men's heart. And we all pray together. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so I do, I do want to I do want to confirm that these are all good practices, especially getting to Mass early, praying with the readings. Okay, I'm going to come back to a few other things uh, in a little bit, 
I, but I want to kind of talk to you about the structure of Mass itself, that when we understand who it is that we're coming to meet in the Mass, we have to remember that, that really the, 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 the Catholic Mass is composed of two main parts, what we call the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist. Now, those, they're like the, the two halves of the sandwich. Within that, you've got some different little parts and everything, but think of it like this, that when I go to Mass, the first part is that I'm going to be fed by Christ's Word. Do I want to be fed? Am I looking to be fed? Okay, so part of doing the readings, looking at the readings the night before or the morning of, is like, okay, I know Jesus has something for me. I know God the Father wants to, to feed me with something of His Word today. What is that going to be? Lord, speak, your servant is listening. You know, we, we have these, these verses from the Scripture that help us to realize that, that, that we're about to get the Word of God in the Mass itself. So when you think of the liturgy of the Word, you're thinking uh, we've got the readings, generally Old Testament. You've got the responsorial psalm, which is probably written by David or one, uh, one of the patriarchs. Then we've got generally a second reading from uh, St. Paul or St. James or one of the uh, other epistles. And then, of course, we have the gospel, the words and actions of Christ Himself. In that, God could, could choose any way He wants to, to speak to you. He could speak to you through something in the Old Testament, something that's in the psalm, maybe uh, the, the New. But a lot of times, there's something in the gospel itself that Christ wants to communicate. Then, of course, it's up to us as priests and on occasion deacons who preach to really, um, hopefully, give, give you something practical. But I'm, I'm going to let you know that sometimes it may not be the homily that, that, that moves you. It's, I mean, let's hope that actually the Word of God itself gets to you before, before you actually hear how it's moved your, your ordained minister to present to you. And so, I'm telling you that God has something in store for you. You have to be ready to receive it, though. You have to be disposed to that. And so think of it that the word that you're receiving the Word of God, the, the, the proclamation through hearing, oftentimes, you know, you can either follow along in your missalette if you find that helpful. I find that if you've done the readings ahead of time, sometimes the best thing to do, especially if you're in a place like the cathedral where you know you have well-trained um, readers, is to simply sit with your eyes closed and really listen to it. You already know what the readings are because you've had a chance to read them. But then you can think, okay, what is Christ trying to say to me? Because if you're trying to follow along with your missalette, it's more like, okay, they're reading, I'm reading, la-da-da, before you know it, oh, the homily's here, okay, it's time to stand, it's the creed. You can get your head buried too much in the book and not be uh, at a disposition where you can really receive what God wants to say to you in that mass. So I really uh, encourage you to do your best if you've prepared, then you can actually just sit and, and with your eyes closed or, uh, or looking at the, the reader or the deacon proclaiming the gospel, whatever it is. And so that's, what that's supposed to do is prepare you, now that you've heard the word, that once we get into the liturgy of the Eucharist, that Christ has prepared you to receive the word made flesh in His body, blood, soul, and divinity. The whole idea is that, that you've been receptive enough to, to let God speak to your heart so that now you receive the sacred heart of God, of Christ Himself, in the Eucharist. And that that's uh, the whole idea is that he, he then gives you the strength, especially if you've been cut to the heart about something morally you need to change about your life. Maybe uh, it could just simply be that you've learned something, uh, a, a bit better appreciation of, of, of the Scripture. It could even be um, simply being inspired. Like, I, I really get a sense that, okay, this is why I'm supposed to do this now. But the whole understanding is that if you've received Christ in the, in the Word, then you're ready to consume Him in the Eucharist. And that He feeds not just simply your, your, um, your soul, but He feeds your whole entire person, because Christ gives us, uh, Himself to us in His humanity as well. So let's back up. Before I get into a little bit of the, uh, the theology of the Eucharist, I want to get to the very beginning uh, parts of Mass. That when, we, when we, we look at the two major parts, the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist, pretty much um, the Liturgy of the, of the Word is the very first half part of Mass. Everything from the very opening hymn, you know, whenever we stand and uh, if a bell's rung or if there's announcements made, please stand um, uh, for the opening hymn or the antiphon. 
that during that time there's a sense that uh, a procession, well there is a procession happening and that we participate in this uh, procession almost like those who were there to greet Christ as he entered into the triumphal procession into Jerusalem. This is a triumphal procession because Christ has the victory. We're, the, the Mass is a perpetuation of the one sacrifice at Calvary, but it's also a perpetuation of the resurrection itself. And so we're joyfully, and that's one thing our bishop continue and our pope continue to talk about, that we're joyfully entering into uh, this procession of God Himself. And so to be mindful of doing our best to, to uh, really sing that which is in, in our hymnals, to, um, to really participate in that. If we're not a good singer, then we, uh, you know, pretend like we're singing. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> but in a sense that you're, you're, or you're, you're, you're thinking about the words, um, because again, even the music itself, when it's not the antiphon, the hymn itself is supposed to reflect something of the spirituality of the antiphon, of uh, what is the spirituality of the season right now, the readings, and so you're, you're thinking about that. Um, generally, I, I think that posture is a good thing to talk about too in Mass. Um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're standing in Mass like this, um, maybe it's, it's, it's kind of like, well, uh, is this a very receptive uh, posture? You know, um, I, I, I think you've got to find something that, that works for you that's, that's not too casual, but in a sense that, that's, that's comfortable, even um, you can do kind of the, the, uh, the Irish call this banana hands. Uh, uh, the, I don't know why. I guess it looks like a bunch of bananas. Uh, you know, some type of uh, keeping your hands together. I know it sounds weird, but standing up straight because you're thinking, who am I greeting here? It's not Father Hank. It's not, um, you know, Father Vreeland. It's not the bishop. I'm greeting Christ in the Mass. Um, and so my disposition reflects who is it that I'm, I'm, ex I'm encountering in the Mass. So the procession takes place. Um, I won't get into too much to the, the, the details of what that, uh, oftentimes there's a lot of options, whether it be the, with the incense. Uh, I'll be writing on this in the, in the Catholic East Texas as the time goes on, what a lot of these exterior signs mean. Um, but again, you, you want your attention to be focused on what's taking place at the altar. I, find, I found that before I was ordained, and I was mainly in the, in the pews like yourselves, that sometimes you just have to close your eyes. You know, if, if you find that you're being distracted by a lot of that's going on, on around you, to, to keep your eyes closed um, is a good way. And just simply, when you're participating in the Mass, you, you're hearing it and you're responding. You're making a, an effort to make the responses so that when the priest begins in the sign of the cross, you can, you can, um, you can think about the Trinity. You can ask God to keep you focused on um, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when you ma make the responses, mean what you say. When the priest says, the Lord be with you, and, you know, don't just, well, and, and also with you, or, and with your spirit, or whatever the translation is. <laughs> no. You want to say, and with your spirit. Like, you want the Lord to be with the, the spirit of the priest, the spirit that he received at ordination, so that he can offer the sacrifice well. You know, we, we forget oftentimes that everything's root, root, routine, we don't think about what we're saying. You know, when it comes time to uh, examine our, our conscience, and I'm actually writing this, the next issue of the Catholic East Texas, I'm writing a, um, a little portion on the confidier, the, the I confess to Almighty God. The priest opens up uh, after the greeting saying, Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. And the germ says, the general instruction says there should be a little bit of silence there. Why? Because we have a chance to think about what have I done that makes me unworthy of Christ? Yes, objectively we're all unworthy of Christ, but what have I chosen to do that is a rejection of Christ in my heart, whether it be an action, word, or thought? I mean, I, I think it's important for us to really think about that because we, we want Christ to purify our hearts in order to, to participate more fully but more worthily in the sacrifice of the Mass, in the celebration of the Mass. And so if you've prepared yourself not only in your readings but also, you know, uh, having gotten there early enough to think about, okay, where is it I really need Christ to help me in this Mass, you'll have something actually to think about and ask the Lord 
for help. And then you'll be able to think about, I confess to Almighty God. Once again, as you go through the I confess, really think about it and what I've done in my, what I've done in, what I've, uh, in my words, what I'm thoughts, words, what, uh, what I've said, uh, what I've done, and what I've failed to do. You know, what is it, where is it that I've not fallen down, where I've fallen down on the job. Uh, all these different things that we're, we're thinking about uh, so that it's, it's not just go, you know, we're not just saying the words, that our, our minds and our hearts are in the whole Mass. We receive the prayer of uh, forgiveness from the priest, and then we either hear Kyrie eleison or Lord have mercy. Once again, this biblical, there's repetition. You'll notice there's a lot of repetition in the Mass, not because um, we can't get it through our thick skulls, but there's something about repetition that speaks to the heart. And you find repetition oftentimes in the Psalms, in Christ's own prayer. Father, you know, if this, uh, uh, let this uh, be cup be taken away from you, but nevertheless let your will be done. We hear repetition even in the prayer of Christ Himself. And it, it reinforces, in a sense, what we, uh, what we, what we believe and what we know uh, is the reality of, 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 our, of our need for God in this life. And then we have the Gloria. The Gloria itself, its origins um, go back almost to St. Ambrose, really the verse three, four hundred years of Christianity. It's a mixture of the, the triumphal hymn of the angels at the birth of Christ, mixed with a lot of the, uh, some of the Te Deum, some of you not know the, the Te Deum uh, hymn itself that we use in the, uh, in the Office of Readings. And so it's a very ancient hymn that's rooted in the Bible, once again, and you'll see in there the repetition. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you. There's a, there's a sense that each time with that repetition, we're going even deeper in our adoration of God, of, of uh, the, the triune God. And, and really thinking about that. Again, we can, depending on the setting, sometimes it's a setting we don't know very well, so we're hesitant to sing it. Uh, but especially if it's a setting that we know well, and, and uh, if we know the, if we're really focusing on the words, it's a beautiful prayer of adoration. And then finally, after the, the Gloria, you have the priest saying, let us pray. Once again, a little bit of silent time. That prayer is called the collect. And it's not another time to make a collection. Uh, I found that in Spanish, I have to be um, a little, in Spanish, the word co collect and collection are the same word. La colecta is la colecta. So in English we have two different words, so thankfully. So with the collect, what the priest is doing is when the priest says, let us pray, and there's a little bit of signs, there's a sense that the priest, on behalf of the people, so that you have to remember that, that it's not the priest doing something for us. It's not, um, it's not that the priest is doing something separate from Christ. That the priest in the person of Christ he is he's offering the sacrifice for us, with us, and on our behalf. And so when the priest says, let us pray, let us pray means that we're thinking about what are the things that I'm praying for in this Mass. If I've got, if I've got a sick child, I'm thinking about my sick child. If I'm having some issues with my wife, I'm thinking about, okay, uh, please Lord, I, I'm, I need this Mass to help me figure out how to sort things out and get us on the right track. Problems at work. Whatever it is, or I'm just struggling myself, when we say, let us pray, we're thinking about what is my intention in this Mass? What do I want out of this Mass? So there's a little pause there, and that's when, that's when the priest prays the collect prayer. Now, I'm not going to lie, with the new translation, there's some beautiful prayers, but every so often the phrasing, and you probably found this, Father, it can sound weird. It's like, what did that prayer just say? <laughs> That's okay. I mean, there, there, some, some of these things are rich, but it means that we as priests have to do a better job. Okay, what is this really saying? And then we as lay people also have to, uh, as laymen have to think, okay, what is this prayer saying? Either way, we're doing our best to unite our heart and the intention of our heart with that prayer. And so we want to unite that intention with whatever the, is, is that prayer. And the priest, you notice how his hands go out at that point? It's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a gesture that means that all the people out in the pews and all your prayers that the priest is offering all those intentions to God Almighty Father. And notice how it always ends through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the prayer is being made to the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ, your only Son, um, 
how come I can't ever remember this stuff whenever I'm giving a presentation? Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit. So the, the Holy Spirit is intimately united uh, to the faithful and to the priests and other sacred ministers at the altar. Um, whoever, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. It's like, oh great, we can sit now. Yes. So it's great. So up to that point, your posture has been standing, which is a sign of respect. Now the posture is that of meditation, is of, is of uh, prayerful reception. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, keeping your eyes closed, trying to sit, just like, you know, if you were in, went to Catholic schools and the nuns made you sit up straight, um, you want to, you, again, you, you want to be not ready to go to sleep like a lot of men in church <laughs> and priests in church. Um, but again, you want a, a uh, because posture does make a difference. Uh, if you're sitting up straight and you're, you're receptive, even if you're sleepy, you're going to be more likely to be able to receive what God wants from you. And so, uh, and to really be listening to the readings. First reading, responsorial psalm. Second reading, um, Alleluia. And then, of course, standing for the Alleluia, you understand why we stand at the Gospel. The rest of the readings have all been from the Old or New Testament. But now we're about to hear the words and works of Christ Himself. And so because the Gospel is the, word, uh, is the words and works of Christ, it's again, it's a standing as a sign of, of reverence uh, and, and, and real respect, for, especially for this part of the Liturgy of the Word. We're about to hear the miracles of Christ, His teaching, and not the pre, you know, notice we're not standing when the priest is interpreting it or when the deacon is interpreting it. We're, we're, we're only standing when we're hearing Christ Himself. What is it Jesus is saying right now in the Gospel? What does he mean when he's, uh, when he's saying, um, you know, the, that whoever uh, wishes to be the first of all uh, and, and uh, must be the servant of all? Uh, you know, we heard that in the, the gospel last week. He puts a little, child, a little child in front of him. Whoever receives a child such as this in my name, you know, again, he cries his, what is he saying through all this? And then, of course, we're seated after um, the gospel's read as a moment to hopefully be willing to receive whatever the sacred minister has prepared for us. The only thing I really want to leave you with, with this is um, before we get into the actual liturgy of the Eucharist, how am I doing on time so far, Eric? Doing good? Okay. I'm good about cramming everything in. Um, some of us are great homilists, some of us are not. Even if you have a great homilist, we don't always hit a home run, okay? We're human. We get sick calls. We're, we're, well, I mean, we don't like, we don't want to, we don't want to toot our own horn or anything, you know. Uh, but, you know, thanks, Father. I'm just glad, I'm glad we're here to support each other. <laughs> Since we're such great, I know it's not ever a problem at the Cathedral of St. Edwards in Athens, but um, I want to tell you something that, that was so moving to me. Do any of you know Dr. Scott Hahn? The, you know, one of the um, great converts to the Catholic faith, brings beautiful theology down to everyone's level. Uh, I took a mini course of Dr. Hahn in Rome uh, when I was in seminary there, and uh, just awesome. He, he's just as awesome in class as he is on videos or if you see him on EWTN. And at the question and answer part, um, a lot of my classmates, you know, we, were, we weren't quite priests yet. We were deacons. So we were, we were uh, transitional deacons. We were almost priests at that point. So um, we were in a course and this guy just can quote scripture, verse, chapter verse. He can give you the theology just like that. And uh, one of my classmates was gutsy enough to ask him a question. He said, Dr. Hahn, you know, with all this great biblical knowledge, you know, you go to daily Mass, it's all around parishes throughout America, throughout the world, you must really hear some lousy homilies. Because, you know, Protestant ministers are known for really good preaching, whereas Catholics are not necessarily known for great preaching. And I'll never forget his response because, you know, you can imagine someone like Dr. Hahn saying, yeah, you know, 
it's just these priests didn't get enough biblical theology and it's just apparent what they're saying you know I, I respect the guys but they're not great preachers he could have said that and legitimately been okay but I'll never forget he says you know what he says when I go to mass he says I feel like I'm uh, I'm just a beggar ready to take whatever scrap the father's willing to give me I thought, man, I hope he talks to all my parishioners. <laughs> but I thought, he, out of, out of every, anyone who knows Scripture or who's a practicing Catholic, he would have had the most grounds to criticize priests on poor preaching. But, he's, but I think there's something about that for us is that even when it's not a great homilist or a great speaker, that if we see ourselves as a poor beggar, that God, that God the Father wants to just give us a scrap. If we're willing to receive that scrap, if we're too haughty or proud, we're going to miss it. But if we're humble enough to realize that, that look, I'm not worthy of anything, but, but I know God can speak through this, this human being in front of me who might be Babylon or he might be, the plane might be up here and he's about to land it and then it goes back up again. <laughs> and then uh, it's about to land. Like, oh, he's, he's going to come in for the landing. And then, oh, it just touches base a little bit. And, you know, we've all been through those situations and think, Father, just please sit down. <laughs> or Bishop, just please sit down. <laughs> oh, is this on? Is this thing on? Is this thing on? Is this going to be on the podcast? I'll be getting a call from one of the vicar generals in the morning. So, um, but honestly... Do you really believe that God has something to say to you? Well, certainly through the lectionary, He can speak to you through the readings. But also, if we're humble enough, I think we'll find that God can use any of us to, to really communicate His Word in the way we need. After the homily, there's kind of a natural progression that happens because the homily is supposed to, according to St. Augustine, the homily is supposed to instruct admonish and, it's, and inspire. Okay, so there's supposed to be some level of, of teaching, there's supposed to be some level of inspiration, uh, but it, it's also supposed to exhort us to, to moral perfection, as we call it, and you know, it's a, when we say perfection, we think, okay, what are we talking about? That, that, we, that we want to, to be better Christians. So then it makes sense that we stand, especially at Sunday Mass, and then we, the, we profess the creed. Because what we believe is not just kind of something nice. What we believe is int intimately connected to how we're supposed to live. And also we realize that the martyrs in the history of the church died for this creed. That they upheld this creed. That this is the creed, the faith of our fathers. And so, I'm going to be honest with you, even as a priest, even if I really pray the Mass well, it's very easy to zone out and get into the I believe in one God, maker of heaven and earth. And before you know it, it's like, okay, one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we're almost done. <laughs> uh, you know, life of the world to come, amen. And before you know it, you, you, you've thought, man, I'm so used to saying the creed. Of course, getting the new translation about three or four years ago made us kind of think about, okay, what does consubstantial mean? And um, what does uh, made incarnate of, of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin mean? You know, we're, we're getting kind of back to some of the language that's, that's very much part of our Catholic tradition. It makes us slow down and think about this a little bit more. But part of this is, the creed is, is kind of like, it's our, it's our national anthem as Catholics. Like, this is what we believe, and I'm proud of this. And this is what, what Christians have believed for 2,000 years. And so, trying to take time with the creed and think about, do I believe this? One, one year, about two years ago in my parish, when I was down in Centerville and Hilltop Lakes, I just went through each part of the creed. I, I think during um, probably ordinary time before Lent started, you know how there's a few weeks right after Christmas, before we get to the beginning of Lent, whenever that falls. And I thought, well, I'm just going to go through the creed. And people were like, I mean, I thought, I thought well, they're going to be like, Father's really scraping the barrel. I got more compliments on, on those homilies and all the ones I thought, man, I knocked a bunch of home runs and everything. Like, Father, I never thought about that before. It's like, well, shoot. You know, I thought I was going to bore people to death, but they, got, they were able to, to really get something and were able to receive scraps from those homilies. And so, 
After the creed, we get to what's called the prayer of the faithful, sometimes called the universal prayer or bidding prayers, what the uh, English might call. And these prayers are, now that we've, we've, we've received the Word of God, we've, we've affirmed the Word of God and what that looks like in terms of doctrine, now it's a matter of what are the needs that, uh, of the church, of our, of our government, what are the needs of this local community, uh, of the sick, and then what are my needs personally? These are called general because gen they're supposed to be, you know, not necessarily praying for Miss Susie Q and, um, you, know, her, uh, you know, her foot to feel better. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're meant to be general because, once again, we're bringing as well our own intentions to this. You know, we're praying for oftentimes an end to abortion or uh, we're, we're praying for sanctity of life protection of the Pope. Um, you'll hear a lot of prayers like that, but overall they're, they're going to be pretty general so that we can keep in mind our own uh, intentions during that time. And once those general intercessions are ended, amen, we get to sit down again and we get to uh, take out our wallet or our offertory. Your favorite part. <laughs> So th this part officially closes the, uh, the liturgy of the Word. So, we, so when we sit down after the, the bidding prayers, after the, the general intercessions, we have, we've, 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 we're, we're now going into this transition into, now that we've heard the Word, now we're about to receive the Word in His flesh and blood, soul and divinity. This is also the point, and I think um, many, many Catholics forget that, this, that, that the whole idea of the offertory, yes, you have generally a lovely family brings up the bread and the wine, but we forgot, forget that there's actually a spirituality of when we put our little bread in the basket, we're saying, Lord, everything I've done this week, yes, to pay my bills, to put food on the table for my children, to live a comfortable life. Everything, Lord, is a blessing from you. I know this sounds Protestant, but now I'm returning a blessing to you. That's actually very Catholic. That's, that's called stewardship. Um, some people work for the diocese and do this stuff where they talk about stewardship. Everyone's like, yeah, stewardship means money. But in a sense, because, I mean, y'all are not, your wives aren't baking bread for the Mass. Uh, at least I don't think that's happening at the cathedral right now. And um, <laughs> you're, uh, you're not exactly, you know, y'all aren't uh, venters. Is that what a, someone who, who uh, makes wine? Vintner. Vintner. Okay, thank you. I haven't had anything to drink yet, <laughs> but, I, but I will after this presentation. So you're not actually making the elements that are being used for the wine, but what you are doing is saying, here's my sacrifice. This is where my faith is. It doesn't mean, you know, it, yes, we, we, all, we don't exactly all uh, contribute the same amount of money, but our sacrifice has to be equal, that we're making equal sacrifice. And that looks different for everyone, that we're, 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 we're saying, Lord, thank you for all your blessings. This is what I'm doing to return those blessings to help the mission of your church. And, um, and we priests love to see what those blessings are on Monday morning. <laughs> my fault, my fault, my most grievous fault. So then, of course, those are brought forward with the bread and the wine. Once again, the bread and the wine which will become the body and blood of Christ, but also the, that that way, that sacrifice that you've brought to the table, that you brought to the altar of God, is usually not set in front of the altar. It's usually set somewhere near the altar to, to signify that um, that your sacrifice that you put in there, but also the sacrifice of your lives, is all in union with what's about to take place at the altar. Does that make sense? I think that that's um, that. Oftentimes, people forget that. Okay, this is part of part of my participation in Mass. This is part of my spirituality. This is part of uh, a returning what God has given me. So then we, the, the 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 priest and the deacons have some interesting things they're doing at the altar at this point. Um, they're they're preparing. Uh, again, you you have the corporal being laid out there. You have the chalices. The servers are bringing the chalices over to the acolytes or the deacons. They're preparing things. 
Uh, the water and the wine, uh, once the wine has been brought up there, the wine is poured into the chalices and then uh, just a little bit of water is added with the wine. It's a sense of, um, of uh, what we call uh, the, uh, the commingling. Uh, the water is a sign of Christ's humanity um, and the wine being a sign of the divinity. And so uh, there's a sense of, 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 the, of the mingling in Christ of, of His divinity and humanity in one person uh, that we're about to, that He's going to uh, change the bread and the wine into His body, blood, soul, and divinity. And then, of course, um, we, we stand at the point when the priest says, pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice, and as you notice that, he, that with the translation change, it says, my sacrifice and yours. It used to be just that our sacrifice. Well, yeah, that's all nice. But it's deliberate. It's the direct translation of the Latin that it's, that yes, it's the priest who's in the person of Christ offering the sacrifice on behalf of you, but he's saying, my sacrifice and yours. So your, your sacrifice is that of your lives. You put a little bit of your sacrifice of your money, but we're not just talking about a thing. You're, you're offering your life in sacrifice. Whatever your vocation is, whatever your state of life, that you're offering, that you're, you're mingling your own sacrifice with the, with the perfect, uh, unblemished sacrifice of Christ Himself. So we stand at that as, once again, a sign of, of uh, respect, of, um, of really reverence for what's about to take place. The next prayer is what's called the offertory. So you'll notice that the priest's hands are extended once again. And it's, it's a matter of that, now that you've just said that your sacrifice is in union, in union with that, the priest is, is once again gathering all the prayers of the faithful. Uh, as, as the bread and the wine, still bread and wine, hasn't changed yet. And then of course, through Christ our Lord, Amen. You'll notice that over and over and over again, through Christ our Lord. It, the Mass is Trinitarian. You always hear references through Christ our Lord, in unity of the Holy Spirit. Again, we're always doing things in unity with the third person of the Trinity. Then you have the, the preface dialogue. This is one of those other things that we just kind of, we get into a routine and we forget that, wait a second, we're hearing the Lord be with you again. This is like the third time we've heard this. Something big is about to happen, right? Beginning of Mass, we heard the Lord be with you. Before the Gospel, we heard the Lord be with you. We're about to hear Christ's words and actions. All of a sudden, once again, we, we hear the Lord be with you. We're like, is Mass over yet? No. We're, we're still working through it. It's like, wake up again. Everybody there? The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Okay, so if I've been kind of zoning out, okay, get back in the game. Um, so what does it mean, lift up my hearts? It means, okay, my heart has to be back in this. Even if I've been paying attention to Mass, I want this part of the Mass to not just fall on deaf ears or to be um, uh, inconsequential. I really want my heart in this sacrifice. And you notice the, the hands of the priests go up just a little bit more because again it, there's a, a, a physical sign of really the, our very cores being lifted up at this point. And then the, the, the hands go down a little bit. Uh, Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And you say, it is right and just. Um, again, is the, the, the sense that the giving thanks to God is the, is the very, it doesn't add anything to God, but it's the just thing to do because we owe all our blessings to, to the Lord. And so we go through that preface, and it can either be sung, it can be said, but again, we're, we're listening to this preface that kind of leads into the Eucharistic prayer itself. It usually reflects a little something of the season, a little something maybe of the reading sometimes, uh, especially during Lent. You'll notice there's more connections with the preface uh, during Lent and sometimes in Easter as well. But then we get to the Holy Holy, uh, the Sanctus. And this is from Scripture. We have the, the, a little glimpse in Isaiah of the cherubim and seraphim singing, Holy, 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 this, 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 that God is immutable, that, this, that God's presence um, is filling the church, that the angels were joining in with the angels, singing the holiness of God, that they're surrounding us, but we're singing with them. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This understanding that, uh, that was that what was said about Jesus when he processed into Jerusalem, this joyful, uh, triumphant procession that Christ his real presence is about to process, is about to be made present in uh, the here and the now, right in this church. 
And so then we get into the Eucharistic prayer. Priests have four different options. Um, and I won't get into too many. I'll just give you the basic structure of what most Eucharistic prayers have in them. You generally have the part at which the priest hands go over the Eucharist like this. This is a sign of calling down the Holy Spirit. Remember, the third person in the Trinity is very important in, the, in, in, in Christianity because that was a way Christ chose to enter into the world. Remember, when the Blessed Virgin Mary said, let it be done unto me according to your word, she immediately conceived by the Holy Spirit. So the third person in the Trinity is intimately connected with, with Jesus coming into the world. Well, the same way, the priest invokes the Holy Spirit who is intimately connected with Christ changing the bread and the wine into His own substance, into His own person. So the Holy Spirit is connected with that. So you see the hands, that means, and generally you hear the bell ring as well, that's to say, wake up! <laughs> if you zoned off again, wake up, something important is about to happen. See, as Catholics, we need these signs, because I'm going to be honest, we zone out. I can talk about all I want and, and be really deep and rich, but we know that when Mass finally comes around and we've got kids we're trying to keep, we've got, we're, we've got tiredness, fatigue, we've got distractions, kids are screaming next to us, maybe they're our own kids in church. Um, the reality is that, that we, it's not that we don't want to get the most out of Mass, we get distracted and we're human, um, especially these days, we're a lot more, um, a, um, what's, the, what's the term, we're a lot more, AD, ADD, HD, HDDD, however many, they all change, they keep changing the acronyms and stuff, but uh, we, we zone out so much easier and that's why the Mass is there to kind of say, okay, gives us a little kick uh, to keep us focused. Then, of course, the next part, generally after the Holy Spirit's been invoked, is the consecration itself. And so what I really want you to do is that when the consecration is taking place, to really do your best, to, once again, to think about what am I praying for in this Mass? What do I need? Especially, the, you know, you're all generally, I assume most of you are family men. I know a lot of you are young fathers, older fathers. Um, you know, you're, you're praying a lot for your family, for their safety. And when the, when the priest is saying those words of consecration, um, of course we know that, that Christ's hands are working through the hands of the priest, that host is lifted up. And if there's any time to really open your eyes, even if you kept them closed and masked to keep yourself from not being distracted, that's a moment to really look at that host and think about your wife, think about your children, think about whatever maybe sin you're struggling with. Um, financial problems, whatever it is, at that moment, that bread has just become Christ's real presence. That's Christ there. It's also Calvary. It's the one sacrifice that took place 2,000 years ago, taking place right in Tyler, right in Athens, right wherever you live, right in uh, Flint. You know, that, that's Jesus right there on the cross. And yet, we know at the same time, He's resurrected. It's this re all this is happening at the same time. And that's why we want that, those merits of everything Jesus has done for us to be applied to those whom we love. And that through the merits of the passion, death, resurrection of Christ, you know, protect my family, keep, keep me safe, help me to overcome this sin, help me uh, in my job to, to do what I'm supposed to do and not be stressed out. Uh, you're going to be stressed out, but at least uh, to deal with it with God's grace. You want to, you know, and same thing at the, at the chalice. Oftentimes I think using your imagination of thinking of Christ's blood being poured out. Um, you know, the wells, remember when, when the lance was pierced, had pierced Christ's side, outflowed blood and water. Sign of the sacraments of the church, you know, baptism and, and the Eucharist. To really think of Christ's um, side pouring out blood and water for you, for your family. Um, thinking about your, your family in the chalice itself being soaked in the blood of Christ, being bathed in the blood of Christ. I know these are images that, that I myself personally have used. These may be helpful to you, they may not be. But I find that this is where you really want to be focused. Um, the mystery of faith, we, we do an acclamation. Once again, it, it's, it's, it's reaffirming that, that Christ has died, that He's, he's risen, that we, we believe, we proclaim His resurrection. Uh, we look forward to when He comes again in glory. Because the Mass right now is just getting us through until Christ comes back in the second coming. 
Could happen years and years from now. Could happen 20 minutes from now. It'd be great. Y'all have a full belly and everything. And, <laughs> and uh, we haven't had too much beer yet. You know, we're, it's all good. So that 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 uh, the rest of the Eucharistic prayer, there's there's a remembering of what Christ has done for us, which is more than just kind of like, oh, that was a nice memory. It's like this is what's present right now. You hear the priest kind of talk about. The death, of res the death and resurrection of Christ is ascension into heaven. There are uh, intercessory prayers. You'll always hear prayers for the Pope, uh, for the Bishop, uh, for the ordained, but also for the whole entire church. Um, you'll, you'll hear prayers for the dead. For the, and so, the, you know, I think that that's always very comforting for people who uh, are struggling uh, with, with the death of uh, a loved one, especially if you're a widower. Or if you've had a, God forbid, a child who's died again, that 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 we're uniting everything in the mass, even those we love that we've lost in this life, that we we believe are are with the church either in purgatory, or the church uh, in heaven. But either way, we're praying for them that God, uh, you know, that, that God purifies them so they can enjoy eternal light. And then finally, the uh, the ep the the doxology, when when the, the priest and if a deacon is present, holds up the body and blood of Christ. This great, you know, through Him, with Him, and in Him. That everything up to this point has led up to this great Trinitarian that in Christ's presence that we have right now, that we're giving glory to God the Father with Jesus who's right here through the Holy Spirit now and forever and ever. Amen. Then we stand up. We've been kneeling this whole time out of adoration because we can't do anything but be kneeling out of awe for the God Himself. Um, you know, our belief in the real presence that uh, I always tell people that we do all this, especially when I have non-Catholics to say, you know, at, at the Catholic Church we get an aerobic exercise. You know, uh, we're, we're kind of into this new trendy thing where we've got people exercising in church. Well, yeah, we've been doing it for 2,000 years. Thanks. So, have a blessed day. <laughs> So now we get to stand up again. And it makes sense that now that the consecration has taken place, Christ is present right on the altar, that um, the priest um, says uh, that... Um, Perceptus solitaris moniti. What does the priest say? At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say. See, y'all know it. I, I'm just a little young priest. What do I know? <laughs> Yes, exactly. That's a problem. Is I, I, I do uh, read the black and do the red, but I just don't remember the black. So, again, the, the priest at this point is, um, once again, is, is extending the hands as a sign that now we're praying the Our Father with Jesus, the same Jesus who taught the Our Father prayer to his <laughs> disciples. Just a point of clarification here, because I know that there's a lot of confusion about this. This was something Bishop Carada sought to correct and it's assumed that this is not a big problem but generally you go to parishes and still the holding of hands um, is not supposed to be taking place during this time. Uh, do you all know where the holding of hands of the Our Father comes from before it was introduced in the Catholic context? Mm. Well that's why I'm here to tell you. Um, Non-Catholic churches, namely Protestant churches, because they don't have the sense that communion is really the body and blood of Christ, it's a symbol, it's kind of a nice sharing, they don't believe the same things that we do. It's not a condemnation, it's just this historical and current fact. Um, Protestant churches, particularly a lot of different evangelical uh, sects, would hold hands as a sign of their communion. Okay, so that doesn't make sense in the Catholic Church because our communion is more real than any physical touch with one another. Our communion is with the real body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ that we're all about to receive, at least those who are able to receive communion, that we're, we're having a communion that's more real than just simply a human touch with one another. And so we don't need to hold hands because our communion is, is more real and it's, and it's more substantial then, um, and it's and it's more doct it's more doctrinal and in communion with two thousand years of, of history and tradition than our, our separated brothers and sisters. Okay, so some people say, well, even um, even if I don't, we don't hold hands. I mean, I, it's been a custom in a lot of places where people also extend their hands like the priest. And the reason again that you don't extend the hands like the priest is that we have to remember that 
um, the priest is, 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 is functioning on behalf of Christ. He's, but he's offering a sacrifice on your behalf. And so it's a priestly gesture to extend the hands. Uh, so there's no sense that you need to imitate that because the priest is doing that for you in, in the person of Christ. He's not Jesus. Jesus is there on the altar, but spiritually, and He's functioning uh, uh, in the person of Christ, but He's representing you before Christ uh, uh, to the Father. And so um, that's why we as, as Catholics uh, don't, uh, don't, uh, we don't all have our hands like this. It's not a mortal sin. If you've been doing it up to this point, before I answer your question, it's not, uh, and, and some charismatic Catholic churches, some priests have encouraged that, it's, you know, it's not a, I'm just saying objectively here, there's nothing in the documents that show where the laity have their hands extended when the priest does. So it's not a judgment of any, I'm just saying on, on, a, on a level of, if you want to look at just what the documents say, and at least look at the documents in continuity with the, with the tradition, there's no imitation of the priest's gestures. Not even the deacon. So... Did you have a question? Sorry. Yeah, so is the, is the holding the hands of congregation an optional thing? Because I was just in Austin last week, yeah, and that parish did do that. And yeah. So, and we used to here, so I didn't know if it was more about a, kind of an optional thing. Well, Bishop Carrada, um, he really went after that about um, like 10 years. Like I, I think it had to be like 2004, was it? 2003, 2000, around the time that... Redemptionis Sacramentum uh, came out. I'm just going to answer this call real quick because I'm not sure uh, why they keep calling me back.